Act and did a lot of work um, on behalf of the tribes here and getting them talking with the BIA. Um, R. George Watson is a doctor of philosophy from the University of Oregon. And I actually had a lot of experiences with George when I was at UFO. He was sort of like the godfather of Oregon tribal <laughs> archivists at UFO. And, uh, <laughs> yes, we did have to kiss the ring once in a while. <laughs> and, uh, so he um, was very inspiring. He told a lot of really good stories and talked about his family and uh, talked about how he got interested in archives and, and uh, how uh, perhaps in the 70s or 80s he had spent a lot of time in Washington, D.C. and had seen lots of things and got interested in this idea of bringing the collections back to Oregon. And I was entranced with his experience and all the things he had done and seen and how he had inspired the Swart Project to actually do what it did over three different projects. And if it hadn't been for George and all of his work, on him, that would not have really been And uh, uh, I really owe a debt of gratitude to George, and um, I think now I'll let him speak for himself, because I know he's a man of very many words, <laughs> and uh, very many good stories, and I hope to hear him once again. Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> Next he's going to ask me to powder my forehead so he can see through the glare. <laughs> I can see you back there too. <laughs> Going to Washington, D.C. was an exploratory uh, adventure. I did not do research back there. And most of the people who went, went with me did not do research. We were searching. We were searching for those unknown, unwritten pieces of evidence from all kinds of things. And you already know something about that. Have you, have you discussed work with the with everybody? A little bit, yeah. You'll hear more, and I'll give you a little bit more. But I didn't do research. We were just going through and looking and saying, oh, look at this, look at this, look at that. Oh, well, you don't have time to really think, oh, I want that. You look through, here's some, oh, see this name on here? Oh, we want that. If you took time to read it, we'd still be back there. <laughs> so we just had to identify something which meant something to us. So my process was, to start out with, and we were all novices. So I started making lists. The first thing we did was, was look at, take a look at books. What's already printed? And what are the sources? What names are mentioned in places? And so we started looking at uh, uh, I can't even start to name all of them now. But I looked at some of the Beckham's work and, and other people and saw, saw names of, of authors. Say, so, okay, and what's in there? Well, he mentions forts, military forts on the, uh, on the Oregon coast, like Yam Hill and uh, Fort Kitchen and all kinds of things. And then we start looking at, at place names, rivers names. Uh, Nestucca, Yonkawa, and Okwa. And we start writing those down. So we start making long lists. Anything we can come across, we open up a book and say, oh yeah, okay, we can make a list of all these things. And then we start talking with people, people's names. Who were the military people? Who were the publishers? Who, who was written about? Kearney. Uh, I'm not going to be able to name many of them. They did crazy things just come to me. But, but military names from up and down the coast. And Indian agents. And uh, places like uh, uh, Venetia, California. A spot where me messages went from Washington, D.C. to Venetia for the troops that came up the coast. I hadn't planned on talking about this. It's just coming out of some place. I don't know where, but it will be coming out uh, <clears throat> intermittently. So we made long lists. And then, and I insisted we all read through those. See these. Get these in your head so that there's just an inkling of memory in there someplace. Then we start looking at the archives. We went to the unpublished materials, letters, to and from the coast of Washington, D.C. And then we began to find out there were letters which, which extended far beyond the Oregon coast. They were going up into Washington. They were going, well, but, but, and over to Roseburg. Roseburg. <coughs> Where's North here? Good. <laughs> You know, I, I seriously, I, I I don't feel well unless I know where North is. I have to. I've been teaching in the classroom and suddenly I just burst out with, oh my God, where's North? And I, I was feeling dizzy. <laughs> we went through these weird things in D.C and started finding stuff. And just you know, all we could do was just mark it and say, we'll take that. We had a we had a grant, a couple of grants, and we could have materials photocopied. 
Joel Marchambeau gave us some money, University of Oregon gave us some money, and uh, well, I think SEDCO, the Cocoa Economic Development Corporation, gave us money. I don't know who else the first time. But Joellen was paid. said, oh, we'll just pay for her copy. Well, she had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> and, and we stuck, made a stick to her. We, we said, okay, we'll copy this, we'll copy that, we'll copy. And the first time, I'm getting ahead of myself. I brought, I selected out a few writings of my own, which I want to share with you because I think they are superior. <laughs> I would have given myself A's and A pluses on much of this. I've given out only one A plus in a class, and that was last fall. An older student in my class did a did report on Chamawa. And and he also called both of my sisters. <coughs> my older sister Susan crossed over a few weeks ago. And I'm, I'm pleased I can get that out, say that much. I spoke at her funeral service, and uh, I wish you could have been there. This student contacted both my sisters and talked to them and asked about my father's youngest brother. Who was set off at a preteen sent to Chamawa. And I think he got pneumonia. And he died up there. <clears throat> it makes me think of the tragedy of I just have to call them the do-gooders who wanted to make things right. They wanted to make Indians better than they were. And so they're taking children away from their family, sending them off to a totally foreign area place, and trying to do what was stated. Kill the Indian and educate the man. And Freddie died a long ways away from home. So Gerald Glassby wrote, beautiful, I gave him an A plus. Not because it was about me or my family, but because it was superior. But I think I deserve an A plus in some of this. <coughs> and so I selected only the best. <coughs> I'm going to give you a, an explanation of my philosophy of Indian life, thinking, what I see. You won't find this any other place, students. You won't find this, oh, if you read my dissertation, you'd find it, but it's not good that no one else talks about it. I know it. Well, I have heard something similar, but to give you a notion of what I think about Indians, I call this spiritual memory of Indian time. And I say spiritual. How many times have we talk, heard that Indians think in circular patterns? No! No, that's on a flat plane. No, that, that's still linear. Circular. This, I'm talking about spirit, spiritual time. Keep thinking about it. I would like to instill this into each of you. You're dealing anything with old Indian thoughts. All my life, I've heard people remark, Indians never forget. 
They're always bringing up things from the past. I used to wonder that, and as a child, I felt a little ashamed that it was probably true. Then again, I knew that much of the past she thought she forgot, but remembered carefully and told over and over so as not to be forgotten. Sometimes I noticed that some of the old people talked as though they were still living in the olden days and couldn't tell the difference between hundreds of years ago and now. I listened to stories of Polypus, pardon me, old man coyote, and it's out of season. We're getting close. And grew to understand that his magical powers, his tomonomus, were something of a fantasy, or at least useful imagination to make the event of an escapade work for both good and bad results. There were other times, though, when I heard stories or remarks about current happenings that were tied in with older events as though it was all wrapped up in things right now. It's taken me 40 or 50 years of experiences and reflections to begin to understand that for traditional-minded Indians, the past is still with us. It doesn't go away. The past is what makes us who, how, and what we are today. My first identifiable lesson on this took place at Empire one day in about 1947 when I was visiting my Aunt Daisy. She was having some kind of disagreement with people around the down on South Slough and was raving about their eternal stupidity or something like that. As I reflect on it now, I made the fortunate mistake of asking her just what she meant. Aunt Daisy exclaimed something like, they don't even know how to cook beans or make coffee. They just boil the coffee beans and pour off the water and then they throw flour on each other's faces and yell, look! Now we're all white men. <laughs> I asked a couple of other questions about who and what flower, and she blurted impatiently, those soldiers down there camped out there gave it to them. <clears throat> I didn't know there were any soldiers down in Charleston, but I knew that World War II had ended not too long ago, and sort of wondered whether some of them had stayed hidden down there. To say the least, I was puzzled, half startled, and knew when not to ask Aunt Daisy for further explanation. She was awesome, you know. <laughs> it wasn't until about 25 years later when I read about Jedediah Smith expedition coming up the Oregon coast in 1828 and camping on Battle Flat at Charleston. My great-grandfather, Kitson Jinnam Galada Louis, was head man of the Milks and had taken a delegation of 300 men to greet the Smith party out of Cape Arago. The Milok Coos had treated them well, assisting their crossing of both South Slough and Coos Bay when they headed on north. Great-grandfather had also seen that they're having fresh meat and prepared a lavish feast for them. His village was at Carheel Point, a few miles away from their camp on South Sloop. As the Hudson's Bay Company, a cloud expedition, had not camped there, it was probably the Smith Party who introduced the Billups to dried beans and how to cook them. Whoever it was, by 1851, when the Captain Lincoln wrecked on the North Spit, and the Coos helped them salvage their stores from the floundering ship, they had the knowledge of boiling dried beans to get them tender to eat. So it was, when the soldiers gave them coffee beans, the South Sioux residents promptly put them into pots of water and dumped in hot stones to cook them. To their dismay, only dark owl water resulted, which they carefully poured off and started over again. While this process was being repeated, someone opened a sack of wheat flour, salvaged from the, uh, and it was totally uh, strange to them, and it turned their hands and arms white. Then they began covering their faces, also shouting and laughing, look, now we're all white men. Then it came clear to me. 
time did not pass away to be diminished and forgotten, the antics of those South Slough residents, relatives, were still alive and as vibrant in memory today as it had been when it happened. The relatives down there were still guilty in 1951 of the foolishness which took place there in 1851. Aunt Daisy was responding just as she had learned from her mother and grandmother. The present is only a compilation of all memory of events that never happened. Would you repeat that? The present is only a compilation of all memory of events that ever happened. Time is an expansion of experience. Time is spherical. Time is a record of the memory of expenditure of energy. All that has ever happened is memorized and becomes compacted around us just as sound waves emanate from a source and flow out all around. Some events are so dynamic in their meaning and effect that they don't dissipate as quickly as other happenings. They might hang nearby as a cloud or fog, waiting to be reactivated in the present where those memories are as current as what's happening right now. If it's worth saying once, it's worth saying over and over. It must be repeated again and again. Time is a spherical record of the memory of the expenditure of energy. Hence, my description of the development of the black hole and its current effect on today's social cultural concerns, just as it has always been for the people of the Southern Oregon Coast. Our past is our present. Challenge. What are you talking about? 
And it, it's things you already know, all of you already know the concept of linear, linear time. But I like to use the analogy. Time in, in the, what I call the, woo, I call it the Anglo-European Judeo-Christian world concept, worldview. In the Bible, it's called the gaps. The gap, the gap, the gap, the gap. That's not strange to anybody. Is it offensive to anybody? Um, and it starts out there. And it goes. And it, it comes at you. And time. Time comes into your eyes. And it might process in your head a little bit. But then it escapes and it goes out back. And it's gone and to be forgotten. If water in the bridge, don't cry or spill them. All of those concepts. And so time is, is just that, that pattern like this. Don't look back. No, it, it's gone. Leave it alone. And all the old Indians I know had time hanging around them. It was in a big sphere around them. And I, I realized that when uh, when something important happens and you expend energy, that's an expenditure of adrenaline. And that adrenaline imprints in your brain. I don't want to be too scientific here. Not that I am. But it, and it doesn't dissipate. It hangs there. I used to use an example for our students one time back in 50 some years ago. I was at a party with, with young friends when I was very young. And uh, we had a challenge to memorize, it was in a comic book or something, to memorize a series of a, a, a long number. And I was determined I was going to do it, so I went out the front door, I went outside, and I sat. I stood out there in the cold, this down the little beach, cold, and I was, I came back in, and the number was 11413313538728897. I wish I could write that down on the board and show you that I have it memorized from clear back in 1949, 50, somewhere around there. 11413313538728897. It stuck because the adrenaline in my excitement made it happen. Well, that's what happens when, when there's a major event. The people at the mouth of Rogue River talk about the day when it was dark. The sun didn't come up. It was dark. And fire came blowing in from the west. And it wasn't until late Though they finally saw sun sinking in the ocean, but fire was coming in, and this happened in late summer. And I thought, well, how did that, how did that happen? Well, then I read about uh, the eruption of Mount Mazama, which happened in late summer. The explosion went up so high, it blocked out all the sun off all the coast. The southwest wind was blowing. So the ash didn't fall down on the coast. But the, the, the cloud was up there, there was no sun until late. But all the, uh, the uh, uh, Thomas and burning embers were up there and they went out and fell down and went blew them on the coast. I have to say, you know, I, I, I know. I know how old that story is. That was Mount Mazama blowing up. Oh, 9,000 years ago? Something like that. Seven, seven to nine, I, I forgot. 7,500. <laughs> I remember that. Okay. And it was because the, uh, the sanctuary sandals were farther down, that made them close to 9,000. Got it.
Well, I have one more to read to you here. I call this Growing Up Indian. I can't recall when I first learned that I am an Indian. It seems that I always knew that, but I do recall having some doubts about what it really meant and whether I was actually an Indian, just like the real ones I saw in the movies. Those Indians were brave and strong, wearing eagle feathers, war bonnets, riding fast, beautiful horses, and shooting bows and arrows. They were stoic and spoke in broken English, saying things like, me want he big gun like white man, or white man speak with pork and tongue. I knew my father and other relatives were Indians, but they didn't talk like that. In fact, I never heard them talk Indian at all, or at least I didn't think they did. Once I recall asking my dad if he really was an Indian, he smiled to himself and said, yes, he really was. I asked a few more questions as, could you track animals? He said, yes, he could. Could you get right down on the ground and follow their trail where they had walked? He said, yes. Now I was really puzzled. I could imagine him with his nose to the ground and smelling deer scent, just like a bloodhound. I looked at him in total wonder and amazement. I wondered then if I really was an Indian too, or had I just been adopted like a cousin of mine. He assured me that I was not adopted. I wanted to believe him and hoped he wasn't just being nice to me so it hurt my feelings. I knew I couldn't do those things. Maybe it was some kind of in just in instinct that just develops. I decided I'd just have to wait and see if those natural skills developed when I grew older. However, my earliest recollections of my father, George B. Watson Sr., are from the when I was about two or three years old. He seemed to be a grand and important man in a suit and tie with a briefcase, perhaps wearing an overcoat and often wearing a very dapper hat, a fedora, I believe. We lived in Salem, and he worked in Washington, D.C. We received numerous hand-colored pictures and postcards off of those beautiful fountains at night at the stately building and grand statues. Short letters and telegrams arrived from my mother just to say hello. Once we saw him in a newsreel at a movie theater, riding in some president's inaugural parade, wearing a borrowed war bonnet, and riding in a grand touring. When he came home occasionally, it was always with some cigar-smoking lawyer-like man. He seemed very businesslike and sincere, talking and reading legal papers with them. Next, I recall him in the woods when I was about five or six. He took me with him to cruise timber somewhere at south of Camas Valley. As I couldn't walk at his pace, he put me down in a small opening among the old growth Douglas fir trees and instructed me to wait for him to come back. He would walk on to look at a section of timber and return to pick me up later. I stayed in the area he pointed out to me, amusing myself with looking around and just being there. As it gradually became dark, I decided to make myself a bed, crawling back under some huckleberry bushes and sword ferns. I made a cozy nest and was soon fast asleep. I awoke to the startling loud thud of footsteps drawing the ground and coming right at my place of hiding. I didn't have any idea what was out there in the evening dusk, and I stopped breathing so as not to be discovered by whatever giant it was. Suddenly, a loud voice boomed out, Woo! Daddy! Daddy! In relief, I jumped up right at his feet and saw him return. He must have been worried a little that maybe something had carried me off or I had wandered away. He was so pleased that I had taken care of myself and had been right at home in that little opening in the dense timber. He praised me effusively, and I was a little surprised at how pleased he was with me. Since that earliest memory of being in the deep woods, I have never been afraid or lonely out there. It has always seemed comforting to me, and I still love to snuggle down into a cozy nest and sleep in an old growth forest.
I recall another time when they pointed out the place to be where the Indians had gathered for a great meeting to sign a treaty. I had no idea why they would have gone so far into the mountains to do that. It was way up Elk River in Curry County and seemed like an impossible place to walk together. There used to be a large wooden sign there naming the U.S. Army camp and the date of the treaty talks, but the sign is now stolen, and I don't know the year. I think it was 1851. Also, my dad used to pick me up after school. We'd go to Coquille and take me with him to Empire when we'd uh, go to Indian Hall. There, we always discussing. There were always discussions going on, something or other, and the government people seemed so serious, angry times. People would often say, Oh, Georgie, you're going to be just like your father. I had no idea what that meant. I recall my dad saying that when he was a little boy, he'd been to the Gishkiu, Chichkiu, took him up on the hill above South Slough, about where the wildlife sanctuary headquarters are now, and gesturing broadly with her outstretched arms, she told him, All this land belongs your highest papas. Someday, chosh, you get it back. His life work was set for him. He went away in 1898 to Carlisle Indian School and studied law and played clarinet in the Carlisle Indian Band with John Philip Sousa and guest the conductor. His sister Daisy also went. However, he spent the next 50 plus years trying to organize all the Western Oregon Indians into a concerted effort to obtain payments for the land. He wanted to get their land back or obtain compensation for those who had their land taken with no ratified treaty or reservation. I'm sure he would have liked to practice law and make a halfway decent income to support his wife and children, but that was not his predestined or the, the, the destiny. In 1960, he began the daunting task of trying to unite the Indian the Western Oregon in a concerted effort to have the U.S. government and obtain either the compensation due the revenue or obtain land payments for those never ratified. It was a losing battle. But he could not stop working on it. It must have been as though his grandmother was standing alongside him urging, Chach, you get it back. His job was truly impossible. There were delays in Congress, committee meetings, lawyers, senators, some Indians were negligent in turning in their pledge support funds for the enormous efforts in Washington, D.C. Some tribal members back in Oregon became restless, claiming nothing was being done. The progress was too slow. They wanted their money now. Some small tribes even attempted to hire their own lawyers, hoping to present their own separate case to Congress. Frustration and divisiveness among the Western Oregon tribes was as detrimental to the United cause as was the sluggishness the federal government. To make his case, Dad had interviewed the oldest Indians alive, who could tell the history of the people, who was related, where they were born, the old customary fishing places, and much more. The feds considered it all hearsay. Those old Indians couldn't even speak English. Hearsay. My dad hadn't been there when they happened. He just heard them from his elders and was all declared hearsay time after time in the court records. He didn't have access to the Hudson Bay Company records, the Coos Bay area of the 1800s. But somewhere along in 1940s, a strange man named John Peabody Harrington, who worked for the Bureau of American Ethnology, visited Western Oregon and interviewed a few remaining old Coquel Indians who now had land claims attached to the L.C. land claims bill. Harrington was impressed with the information and remarked something like, there is no doubt that these are the true descendants of the aboriginal occupants of this land. That's all it took for the Court of Claims to be convinced. The simple words of an idiosyncratic and white linguist, linguist and ethnographer, ethnologist named John D. Harrington. The Coke Wells were granted their land claims, but the coups had been denied before this strange man just happened to utter a simple opinion. We've all suffered from the hard feelings due to that lack of information, doubt, and frustration for the federal processes. Oh. 
how our young people today and their children will one day be the only people after we elders have passed on. They need to know who we are, who their ancestors were, and learn to understand the ancient formulas for how to live and how to react to life. Just as young oysters or other shellfish seedlings in their early stages of maturation seek a secure place to attach themselves and grow, so do young people with, with developing personality in adolescence. If we don't provide them, they will surely find something else to fill that cultural and spiritual void. They can easily find the gang to give them a feeling of togetherness in mutual distrust and rejection of the parents and social authority. Gruesome episodes of mass suicide by devoted cult followers or mass shooting by distraught youth could and will happen again for those who are searching for the sense of belonging in their place of life. We can't change the course of history, but we have imminent power to change our reactions to it. We can't undo the atrocities of the bloody Holocaust. But we can honor the memory of our ancestors to become better people today than ever before. We may never regain the daily use of our own languages, but we can learn much about our heritage by studying them. Gambling casinos are too often the primary source of funding for that self-sufficiency. Yet the Coquills and many other tribes are wise enough to engage in other enterprises too. But future generations, if not during the current presidential administration, will experience a tax on tribal sovereignty, not experience its removal in the 1850s and termination in the 1950s. Corporate America cannot and will not abide the success, power, and independence of Native Americans unless they benefit substantially in those Native enterprises. The uncertainty of working with Native American sovereign nation is too risky for most to consider. And the prejudice against Native American sovereignty is too much for them to just ignore. The attack has already begun, and most Indians will be caught with their blankets and elk robes over their heads. In 1995, I led a team of Southwest Oregon research project designed to capture the heritage of the Coquille and their neighbors in two trips sponsored by the University of Oregon, Smithsonian, Coquille Drive. The SWARP team brought back over 100,000 pages of historical documents now housed at the University of Oregon Knight Library and Tribal Archives in Western Oregon, Northern California. The SWARP archive contains real materials of obscure laws for hidden information about our culture, language, history, and life ways that have been separated from many of us. We need to renew those aspects of ourselves for the sake of our people who are to come later on. Regaining knowledge of our traditional culture, spirituality, and history is not enough to save ourselves, just as the thefts disallow the testimonies of the oldest Indians as proof of our land claims, so will it happen again. Scientific evidence and proof of who we are and where we came from is the next weapon needed to combat the impending attacks on us. Another John D. Harrington might not show up again to lend credence to our aboriginal rights and claims. The legal battling over Kennewick land, the old one, is just an example of those beginnings. If we as modern day Indians do not take full advantage of the scientific research and detailed information possible <clears throat> in cooperation with our anthropology, archaeology, and historic uh, colleagues, we will be shooting ourselves with the foot and succumbing to the onslaught of our sovereign enemies. We must realize, we must utilize all the scientific information on our ancestors available to us and be prepared to use that same information for our defense to combat the attempts to use our lack of that information against us. The bones of our ancestors must never be put on display for public curiosity, but we must at least know that those remains are indeed our ancestors, and scientific examination is how we must determine such. Just as we now rely on medical science to examine, operate, treat our bodies for better health reasons, 
so must we medically treat and examine ancestral remains without substantial desecration or mistreatment. DNA and carbon-14 analyses are expensive and quite simple and relatively non-intrusive. It is imperative that we support and fund that line of research. Chitsky, you hope that Chomps could get the land back for her descendants and neighbors. Maybe she didn't mean just the land. As she swept her arm broadly across the mountains, up and down the coast, maybe she desired the unity of her people again. She was proud that her grandson was receiving a modern education. Surely she wanted him to learn and utilize all the education that the white schools had to offer. Today, we must follow those same admonitions and take full advantage of our current education and scientific opportunity. We must look to our ancestors for help. If we don't know who and what they are, we can't prove who and what we are today. The current tribal members of the Confederated Truce who were among Sayus Law and the Coquels are primarily descendants of the women who bravely stayed behind, married to white men, remaining in their homeland while their friends and families were removed to the Oregon Coast Reservation. Even though isolated and surrounded by foreigners, they kept the threads of their culture alive as best they could. Their struggle to maintain something of our memories obviously worked. We are here and proud of who we are. Some of my comments and my philosophy uh, uh, are disagreeable to, uh, to other tribal members. And I understand that. I once commented on this, and, uh, and one woman wrote a letter saying that I thought Kennewick man should be examined and stuff. I said, no, I didn't say that. I said that the the scientific efforts of the non-Indian world are going to challenge us in many ways, and that was one of the first ways that has happened. Please understand, I'm saying, if, 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 the, if the people over there don't want it to happen, that's up to them. I'm not telling them what to do. I'm saying what I see as being intelligent use of our skills and knowledge today. That's my notion. If we're going to treat ourselves by x-ray, by surgery, analyses, then why can't we do that with ancestors? Examine them the same way we deal with ourselves. Otherwise, if it's not good for them, it's not good for us. Why do we have our health department? There I am. Who wants to shoot me first? <laughs> <laughs> you asked about the culture of black hole. And I point out, I might have one more short thing to read, which is really poignant. Especially so. I point out that, you know, the history of the settling of the West, 1844-45, the first big wagon train, the first big one, came over to the Dalles, and part of it came down, and some came around Mount Hood, and on over to Oregon City. And then in the 1850s, the, uh, the Christians, well, the Christians already sent, pardon me, but had already sent their emissaries out here to gather the Indians. They gathered them up at, uh, at, at Shabdui. The remnants of, of the valley, 90% of them had been killed off by the diseases which came up the Columbia and up the Willamette on over. 
but the rest of them who were still suffering had been gathered up and taken to, to the mission, which was virtually a death camp. It was virtually gathering them up and getting them out of the way so they weren't in the way of their settlers coming to the valley. That's my opinion.
all of the culture, the physical culture of Southwest Oregon was was squashed. Buildings were burned. You know, you, you probably know this history. I I don't know, but villages were burned. That's why I refer to it as the Holocaust. Some Jewish scholars, friends of mine, object to that and say, "Oh, I'm sorry." But you don't understand. It happened here first, and if we had, if they had had the same skills and modern technology that Hitler had, it would have happened here that same way. It would have been even more devastating. But that took out the connection of the spiritual memory, all of it, with the land, and nobody gathered it up. Nobody was here. It was later that a few people, like Andy Miner Peterson, you probably know that name, were interviewed and gave something of the languages. But my grandmother and great grandmother, the last of the Bossics who were tribal historians, archivists, if you will were not interviewed. And in explaining how it was so thorough, I like to quote from Melville Jacobs. He wrote, indications of the extensive variety of lost languages, myths, tales and cultural traditions of the Pacific Northwest, and most particularly in southwestern Oregon, can be noted in the writings of Melville Jacobs. He writes, Northwest states before 1750 had 60 to 70 Indian languages, two or three thousand bands, hamlets or villages, and something under, around, or over 200,000 people. This hunting, fishing, gambling population could once have yielded a million or more versions of myths, smaller numbers of tales, and no, uh, no one can estimate how much other oral genres. Myths of most variable merit that have been collected over the region total less than a thousand and will never exceed that. Tales amount to a few hundred, forever so. The bleak harvest is maybe 1% of what could have been obtained if the culture-bound, condescending, and racist invaders had had the slightest capacity to proceed with merit in the heritages of non-Europeans. By the time anyone with such capacity went to work, native humiliation and extinction had erased almost everything. Folklore-oriented linguists late after the pioneers Folklore-oriented linguists and they were the earliest recorders of myths and tales arrived too late after the pioneers had trampled upon and destroyed the Indians. Gilbert Jacobs, 1970. My last comment is, many tragic tales would be told about the conflicts and atrocities suffered by Oregon Indians, such as the horrible slaughter or outright mass murder of Nosoma Village instigated by pack women's sidekick Soapy. The effect on the tribe of Southern Oregon was an American Holocaust, just as suffered by the Jews during World War II in Germany. Just as the Holocaust in Germany must be taught and remembered, so must the Holocaust in Oregon be taught in our schools, so Oregonians and other Americans will know the true history. That knowledge might better ensure that such a Holocaust never happens again. Federal policies of acculturation thoroughly decimated the culture and cultural integrity of small Oregon tribes, including the Coquels. The struggle for self-awareness and self-sufficiency has produced extensive social political schism among Coquel tribal members and between the tribes and outside public agencies. Many young tribal members are desperate to gain insights and understand, understanding of the overall processes of cultural change and acculturation of the older generations. Foremost in their needs is to 
develop insight into the history, language, and cultural traditions which have so thoroughly eluded most tribal descendants today. In pondering the analogy of the cultural black hole of the Southwest Oregon coast, it should be noted that black holes of outer space are thought to absorb and condense all available material within reach, but there are no longer visible and identifiable to the outside observer. With that analogy extended to the culture of the Cocoa people, it would seem that extensive and diligent research from an outside perspective, from an inside perspective, might reveal the condensed or hidden information so vital to the reculturation of the Cocoa and their neighbors.